So um, next, uh, I get to introduce uh, Pamela Russo, who you just heard ask a question, who's uh, uh, graciously agreed to fill in for Martha Gold, who was going to moderate this panel, but who's uh, not able to be here. Pamela is Senior Program Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for, for many years. Um, we've had a delightful 20 years of working together on various projects. Um, she focuses on a lot of issues like health impact assessment, health and all policies, addressing inequality, and uh, community level prevention. So Pamela, welcome up here and to chair this next panel. Do you want our speakers to come up? Or? Yeah, they'll come in. Okay. So I'd like to welcome you to our first um, panel of folks who are, like our first two, um, actually have a, a lot of depth of experience that they're going to share with us about particular models that they've developed. We're going to hear from three different modelers with, uh, as I said, long experience, all of, whose all of whose models have been applied in different situations to inform decisions made in very different arenas. Um, all of which use uh, nonlinear, dynamic, interactive models that cross multiple disciplines. So I think we'll get a little bit more in-depth experience about each one of these um, areas that they're working in and the applications that they've tried to use. Our first speaker will be uh, Bob Mendez. I'm sorry, David Mendez. Sorry, David. Um, who is from the University of Michigan School of Public Health and who has many uh, much experience with the area of tobacco modeling, tobacco reduction modeling, with policies um, and across across uh, international boundaries as well. So he'll share some of that experience today in terms of how well it can be used to inform uh, <laughs> policy decisions. Um, and then we'll hear from Pasky Pasquale, who is a lawyer and a scientist from the EPA, directed the regulatory environmental modeling. And I'm hoping that he's going to tell us a little bit about um, the model's use in court cases as well. I, that was an intimation that he made that, that we might even hear about that arena of application as well as for regu regulatory policies. And finally, we'll hear from Bobby Milstein, the director of Rethink Health. Again, many years in the modeling area of public health and now healthcare as well, who's, who integrates um, these models and presents them to communities, whole communities, to use together to inform their decisions and move action. Um, so I will stop there. I just I want to warn you that if you have questions, you might want to jot them down. We're going to hear from all three speakers. Then we're going to have a break. And then we will come back for our Q&A session. So if you have questions, you might want to jot those down to remember. Thank you. Uh, David. Um. So um, good morning. Um, I'm David Mendes from the University of Michigan. Uh, my background is uh, being in, as in system science and uh, operations research, but I've been working on developing tobacco control mo models for, for a while now. And today I want to uh, give a little bit of an example about how computational models in tobacco control has, have been used uh, without going into a lot of detail in any, uh, in, in, in any of them. Um, so I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. David Levy and Dr. Rafael Mesa, who provided also some uh, background slides uh, for, for models in which they have been working on. So um, I'm to reiterate what other speakers have been said. Why do we model, and, and specifically in tobacco control, want to understand the problem that might be complex and get those mental models uh, explicit? And so we can actually interact with them. We can monitor and forecast a situation and how they develop. We want to evaluate consequences of policy. Those uh, experiments that we cannot do in real life, we can do those experiments in the computer and see what the consequences might be. We can guide data collection so we can identify gaps in the data and our knowledge 
and uh, uh, go after, after that data that is missing. And there's some examples about questions that the type of model I'm going to discuss, you know, have been helpful in or, or could be helpful in, in clarifying. Uh, those, are, those are just some examples. For example, um, what would be the population health impact of removing um, mental cigarettes? Um, for example, if current conditions continue in smoking, uh, in smoking behavior, what is the trend, what is the expected trajectory of, of prevalence? Uh, we, if we implement everything that we know about tobacco control, what would happen 30 years from now, 20 years from now? What is the expectation of, uh, in, in tobacco, um, on tobacco trends? Uh, if we remove, for example, menthol uh, cigarettes from the market, what would be the health impact? Uh, what could be the adverse consequences of doing that? Um, increasing minimum purchasing age for tobacco products, so some clarity of, of potential uh, um, outcomes. And an IOM report just came out that they use modeling just to inform uh, some of their decisions. Uh, uh, what would be, for example, the impact, uh, positive and negative, of, of uh, reducing nicotine in tobacco products to non-addictive levels? Uh, has uh, how can we evaluate if uh, tobacco control policies have worked uh, or not? So all, all these kind of questions uh, are amenable to be a study, maybe not answered totally, but at least clarified uh, with the use of models. So I'm going to talk about you know three very briefly about three different models that we. Um, that, that have been used in, in tobacco control to provide some uh, answers to, or, or, or to try to provide some clarity to these types of questions, not all of them. Uh, one of them is one that I've been working on for a while uh, with some colleagues in Michigan, mainly uh, my colleague Ken Warner for, um, from um, the University of Michigan. And this is the Michigan model of smoking prevalence and health effects. And uh, what, what what we actually had in the model is uh, we identify, we take a look at uh, individuals in the population, and we d differentiate those individuals by smoking status, gender, uh, age, uh, different characteristics, and then uh, we just keep track of those individuals in a computer uh, over time. So from when they are when when they are born until they are until they are. Uh, until they die, and we take a look at the probability of initiation, the probability of cessation, how the way they interact, how policies affect them uh, and change their smoking status, and then how they accurate some health effects or not when, uh, when they move through um, uh, these models. So uh, the, the type of models that are, are we are we've been working primarily is what we call aggregate models in which we actually do not make, uh, we don't follow a specific individuals without in, a, in a computer, but we, we follow groups of individuals. Instead of saying these smokers and these smokers and this person is not a smoker, we say we just count them and we say, oh, these are the number of smokers, these are the number of non-smokers, because, because within, within, certain, within certain divisions and characteristics, we, we, we think, we make the assumption that those groups be, be, behave in an homogeneous way. And then we just you know, uh, uh, keep track of those numbers through times. Uh, this is the uh, analogy that, that this, some of these models represent, is the bathtub analogy in which we have uh, inflow of, for example, new smokers, the outflow of uh, uh, people uh, you know, leaving the system because they die or because they quit, and the, the volume in the middle, this is what we, we, uh, uh, we take care of, we just keep track of, uh, is, is the smoking prevalence, is the, is the volume of individuals with certain characteristics, and uh, that determines the you know, health effects and, and so on and so forth. Now, when we build models like this, um, you know, the, the, the first thing we want to do is, is uh, try to build some kind of confidence in the model. We have some idea, some theory about how those uh, elements interact, and how people, what, how, how people start smoking, how people quit smoking, what's the relapse rate of, of individuals, uh, and they vary by age, etc. But but what we want to do is when we have this mental model more explicitly in a computer uh, or, or in a mathematical model, 
we want to make sure that uh, that we, we want to make sure that is um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good representation of what's, what's you know happening in the real world, and we have you know there are many different tests that you can do, but you know simple tests will be well let's feed the model to real data and see how the model behaves, how they accord to real data, and sometimes we can actually infer parameters, we can infer from from that data uh, in certain conditions uh, what the cessation rates, for example, uh, imply for the model, and and like any statistical model, if you see a good fit, a good R square, for example, you might have a little bit more confidence that the model is, is actually uh, keeping track of what, uh, what, what you are trying to model. But also, you know, once you develop this model, you just project away uh, and figure out, and then you can keep track of whether your projections match what uh, the, what the, the observation that you have without manipulating the model any further. So you just simply just project away and you just wait for the data to come up and then you look at s wh wh whether, whether there is a um, accordance to what you see and what the model predicts. And that will you know, build a little bit more confidence in the model. So this is um, uh, a feeding of uh, the, our initial model uh, from data from 1970 to 1985. Then we developed some projections uh, of uh, what would happen if we d do this on sensitivity analysis on the initiation rates and what would happen with the smoking, what would happen with adult smoking prevalence. This is how then the model, um, have, we, we have kept track of, of the model um, predictions with data from NHIS, which in the National Health Interview Survey, which has been very good. And then we keep keeping, we keep looking at the model predictions versus the uh, real data and see um, you know, what the model accords or not uh, well. Then uh, you know, we took another set of data and another set of data, the, the cancer prevention study two data, and we develop relative risks, uh, another model for relative risk for uh, former and uh, current smokers for male and female, and uh, the former smokers um, differentiated by, by uh, year squid, et cetera. And then we put this into the model to help us you know, uh, understand the health effect. So we have a prevalence model, and inside the prevalence model, we have these equations that can predict because of your uh, health, your smoking status, and the time that you have been smoking, how, how you know, what, what would be the relative risk of death, and then we can actually make some inference about uh, uh, more uh, other you know, morbidity characteristics. So in essence, that, that we have is, is these models of compartments that keep track of people by age, by smoking status, from, from when they born until they, they die. And then we have uh, the possibilities of putting policies in place in this model that affect the initiation and cessation rate, the probability that people start smoking or quit, and so we can externally get those uh, effectiveness of policies and then f put that into the model and do comparisons. Uh, so what would happen if we put this policy in place and uh, uh, put that model forward in, and, and, and figure out the survival course of the population into the future and then analyze uh, what are the effectiveness of the model is. So we can do, uh, for example, start a, um, a, a base case scenario with the status quo. What if a current condition persists versus, oh, let's implement these types of policies that we know they are effective in this set of way, and then let's see how it translates into the future in, you know, uh, um, gain health status, avoiding uh, avoidance of uh, morbidity and mortality, etc. So now um, we have done some applications in the model. I'm, I, I'm going to list uh, a few where I'm going to go into all of them. But some of the model applications that we have been working on uh, is uh, assessing smoking prevalence targets for uh, the healthy people uh, uh, targets or offering smoking cessation programs in managed care organizations. So that's kind of a, a, a combination of an economic um, 
uh, cost-benefit analysis of, uh, uh, of uh, using uh, the, this kind of model. So is, is it fi financially um, desirable for a managed care organization to provide smoking cessation uh, uh, programs? And we found out that, that it wasn't. It was a wash because uh, they, there's a lot of turnover in, in the managed care organization that, that there was a lot of externality. Uh, when the, so, so people would get the benefits and then leave the managed care organization so they didn't recoup all the, uh, the benefits. So it was a very interesting um, study because we went thinking that there was, of course, there was a you know, clear benefit for a managed care organization to put uh, uh, a smoking cessation program, but we found that it, was a, it, it wasn't uh, a disincentive, but it wasn't an, they didn't have incentives. It's a huge incentive for society as a whole, so it's a public health problem, right? So society gains a lot, but not a particular managed care organization. So it calls for some sort of regulation. Now, uh, evaluating the impact of menthol cigarettes on population health. I'm going to talk about a little bit more because that's a work that I did with uh, the FDA and the, and the uh, Center for Tobacco Products, and, uh, and uh, there's some, some lessons learned uh, out of this modeling exercise. So uh, the evaluation of effectiveness of rather remediation on the declining smoking rates uh, is, uh, uh, you know, radon is a uh, uh, is a, a radioactive gas that produces lung cancer uh, the, uh, and is the uh, second cause of lung cancer after smoking. And the question is, there's a lot of interaction between radon and people who smoke. And uh, the, the, there's some guidance uh, by the Environmental Protection Agency about remediating, remediating your home uh, if you have high level of radon. The problem is that uh, there's no clear distinction when, when, um, uh, when those policies are put in place that, uh, between smokers and non-smokers. And they said because of the huge interaction of smokers and non-smokers, those policies make sense more for smokers than, than non-smokers. And uh, with declining smoking rates, the, the effectiveness of, of this recommendation is questionable. And we study that with a, actually a colleague of mine in the audience, Paula Lance, is, uh, uh, is a co-author with me and in, in that um, in that study. And uh, um, evaluation, uh, we did an, an evaluation of uh, uh, control policies on global smoking trends. So we use data from the WHO databases and we use these models for uh, different uh, um, sections of the world and by country in, in which we, can, uh, we could uh, uh, get the information. And we extrapolated, uh, well, actually we used modeling in order to find out what would happen with the world prevalence of smoking if uh, current conditions continue or if we can implement at the global scale everything that, that we know about tobacco control and how can we can curve the, the epidemic and by how much and by how. Uh, by when, so and you know that's uh, something that is being I think quite useful for the WHO in in um, communicating pot possibilities of tobacco control worldwide. So let's meet. Let, let's talk about a little bit about the smoking prevalent targets. This is a a, a work that uh, you know the model was very useful in uh, analyzing in 1999 uh, the um, uh, Healthy People uh, 20, 2010 goals were uh, set for smoking prevalence at uh, 12 percent. They started at 13 percent, then 12 percent. That means that in 1999. Uh, there was a uh, there was a call. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a, the goal for the nation for 2010 was that the prevalence of smoking uh, was going to be 12 percent. We analyzed the 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 uh, using models that the possibility of reaching that target, and we cons we we figured out that in order to have in order to to reach that goal, there will be. Um, a, an incredibly increase in initiation, uh, decrease in initiation, and increasing cessation rates are were infeasible. So we say that that cannot happen. So the, these these targets were made, you know, pretty much without thinking about the mechanisms that drives uh, prevalence. And what was going to happen is that 
uh, people were going to get discouraged because it's not that we fail in tobacco control policies, but because they were so outrageous that you know we, we the, the the public health community will going to feel like a failure uh, by not achieving them. So we just made that point, and and uh, our pro projections were that we were going to be between 18 and 19 percent, and we were in 2010, exactly about uh, NHIS. Uh, um, reported 19.3 percent. The, the, the model was was really good with our projections from um, far uh, uh, below. So then we said, you know, later on, it's not enough to say, oh, you are wrong. Let's use these models to actually come up with something that is feasible, is challenging, that is feasible. So with the model like this. Uh, to look at places in the country that have been achieving, um, uh, that have been very successful in, in tobacco control policies. We chose California as a model. And we said, what if the country can emulate the cessation and initiation rates of, the, um, of California? What would that entail? What would that uh, look like into the, in the future uh, for in, in 2020? And we figured out that uh, if that happened, which is a very, very challenging uh, proposition, the country would be about 14.7% uh, in, in prevalence. So, um, you know, we published a paper and we would recommend that, that the target for 2020 be set about 14%. And what we know now is that for these targets are being made using these kind of models right now. The target was set at 12 percent for 2020 because it's very difficult to start to, to, to set a target for uh, the year 2010 at 12 percent and then raise it for 2020. So they kept that at 12 percent. But there is a, 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 a recognition that understanding these mechanics uh, uh, is important. Uh, Another very um, uh, interesting project that we work uh, using modeling was the impact of menthol cigarettes uh, on the population. So the, um, we, the FDA commissioned uh, you know, uh, the, uh, this model, actually through the, the Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee, the, the FDA had to regulate, had to, uh, uh, has to regulate or has the the, the potential to remove menthol cigarettes in the population. The menthol cigarettes are preferred by African Americans. They say 80% of African Americans smoke, smoke uh, menthol cigarettes. But there's also in the general population, there is uh, the knowledge that there is uh, a higher likelihood of initiation uh, um, if you start with menthol cigarettes. So the question was, if we, if we have this hypothetical scenario, if we remove menthol cigarettes, what would be the impact on population health because of that? And OK, those models you know, uh, I, I are not going to give you the, the, the total answer, but they will give you the magnitude of the problem. So with, uh, and, and this is a, is a very interesting um, Exercise because I wasn't, uh, you know, expert on menthol uh, per se, but I work with a panel of experts uh, on menthol that were in the Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee. They provided the best information they have about the sensitivities and the ranges of the input, and when we came out with a, se a series of scenarios that could, you know, indicate what would happen if we remove menthol from the population, uh, you know. Uh, ended up as, as an expectation, as a mean value with some sensitivity analysis around that we, we would, in 40 years, we would avoid 330 uh, premature death and uh, about 9 million, do 9 million new smokers over a 40 year period. So, uh, based on, you know, not just solely based on that, but the, the the, the Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee used these results to foster their recommendation to the FDA or the, uh, the uh, claim to the FDA that removing menthol from the, um, the market would be beneficial to the public health. So that's a, a, a clear use of you know, the result of the model in, in that specific area. So, OK. So um, there's. Um, you know, uh, uh, another model that uh, we, uh, that is, is very uh, well known 
uh, in tobacco control is seam smoke developed uh, mainly by uh, Dr. David Levy, Levy from uh, Georgetown uh, University. And this model has been very useful in um, has been, uh, been applied in many different countries and the states. And uh, this model uh, is, is essentially like the Michigan model, but they have a, uh, a much more focus on policies and how policies uh, affect uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, prevalence and, and, and the downstream of uh, uh, initiation and cessation. So they have been very careful in evaluating a set of policies and how they work and uh, they have different modules to implement different kind of policies. And uh, they have been very good at, uh, at following uh, the, uh, the, uh, the nuisance uh, that are produced by uh, policies uh, in, in, in different settings. So this is very quickly an example of that. Uh, CISNET is a network of models and modelers that look at uh, cancer. And uh, because of they look at cancer, one of the, um, they look at lung cancer, and they have developed a very interesting models for uh, tobacco control, and especially the smoking history generator. They actually have uh, used databases from NHIS data in which they can reproduce the history of a smoking, artificially the history of a smoking for any cohort in the population. So you can, it's actually available through the public. So you can, they can, you can say, I want to uh, reproduce the, uh, the history of a smoking for a person that was you know, born in 1960 or in 1970 or in 1925. And doing a statistical methods and simulation models, they, they can do that. But they have used that model in order to evaluate. Okay. They, they, have, they have used this model in order to evaluate how the smoking control policies have worked since 1964, since the publication of the, um, the, the Surgeon's General Report. And you know, I'm not going to too much detail because I'm out of town, uh, out of time. Uh, but uh, but uh, they published a very interesting paper in JAMA last last year, in which they. Uh, use this model to find out that uh, uh, a smoking tobacco control policy estimates about a million uh, you know, avoided death and uh, uh, premature death and ex ex increase the lifespan of those individuals by 20 years. So you know, I have some ideas about where the field is going, but I'm out of time, and then uh, we, can, we can leave that for the discussion. Thank you very much.